going to start, it's going to be live now, so I'm going to start letting people in. Thank you everybody for joining us so far. Um, if you could, uh, to make it easier for the presenters and everybody watching on Facebook, if you could uh, stop your video so that we can have the presenters on the screen. We're gonna start in just a couple minutes as everybody gets settled. Um, my name is Chris LaFuria. I'll be uh, giving introductions and I'll introduce all of our speakers. So hang tight, we'll get started in just a couple seconds. All right, welcome everybody. We are going to get started here today. Uh, there may be some people joining us. We wanna welcome everybody to today's Black History Month presentation and a nice keynote address that we have for you. Just some quick uh, procedural things. We are gonna be uh, live streaming this on Facebook. So thank you everybody for joining us on Facebook or um, on this Zoom chat. It's a pleasure to have everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Lefuri. I'm with Edinburgh Communication and Marketing. Um, and I'm just gonna introduce uh, Dr. Dale, who is our interim president, she's going to give a welcome. We also have Dr. Terrence Mitchell, Dr. Adrian Dixon from Edinburgh, and Dr. Siobhan Shorter, who is our uh, keynote speaker today. So if, if you do have questions throughout this event, please feel free to, to drop them in the comments and we will get to them towards the end of the presentation. Uh, if, if Also, if you're following us on Facebook, you can submit questions in the, uh, in the chat section, the comment section. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dale for the introduction. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate um, that you gave me this opportunity. Um, Terrence Mitchell asked me if I would be kind enough to uh, introduce our, our keynote speaker today, Dr. Siobhan Shorter, and I am pleased to do so. Um, Black History Month is a month long adventure in heralding and bringing forth the great history of uh, Black Americans, black, black, black citizens from all over the world. Our history is very rich. Sometimes in the United States, we tend to focus on the history of slavery. The rich history is much deeper and wider and richer. And today we're going to talk about some of those things. Uh, Dr. Sirvan Shorter uh, teaches communication studies at Bloomsburg University and has been there a number of years. Her, she is well known for her, her classroom experiences and what she brings to the fore so that students can learn uh, differences, embrace richnesses, and look at all of the rich history that we have. I am going to now turn it over to Adrian Dixon, Dr. Dixon, but before I do so, I would really like to thank everyone who was involved in putting this month long uh, activities, presentations, films, poetry, all the things that we've done across the state system and at our two universities, Edinburgh and Clarion University. It has been quite a month long adventure and a lot of work by a lot of people and very important work. So I wanna thank everybody for this and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Dixon. Again, thank you, Dr. Dale, um, and welcome everyone. We're excited about 
um, today's activity and presentation. And we're so happy that you were able to join um, and be with us today. You know, I am the co-director of the Frederick Douglass in, uh, Institute at Edinburgh University. And the Frederick Douglass Institute at Edinburgh is a part of a larger collaborate across um, the PASHI system. And our, our goal and our mission is to look at um, highlighting programming and opportunities that bring spirit and legacy of um, Frederick Douglass, you know, who was a distinguished orator himself and was committed to looking at um, inclusiveness. And so we want to look at um, bringing that to the universities across the Apache system and look at transformative connections amongst historically under, underrepresented students and faculty members, as well as other communities across the Commonwealth and behind and beyond. And so today's presentation by Dr. Shorter is really a timely one, given everything that's happened over the past year and everything that is continuing um, the dialogue to occur in our communities. And so so we want to talk about, um, she's going to be talking about the value of um, Black History Month, Black History activities, and why it's so important to continue that dialogue, continue the conversation. Again, thank you so much um, for everyone chiming in. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Siobhan Shorter, who is our keynote speaker today. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. It is so nice to see your beautiful faces and your names popping up here as we get ready to celebrate Black History Month. It is really a joy to be here with you. And my only regret is that we cannot be together in person. But of course, safety first. Uh, but indeed, no computer screen could hold back the level of solidarity and unity and connectivity that flows amongst us, even as we are on Zoom together. Before I begin, I'd like to first start by honoring some members of our community. I am so grateful to Dr. Terrence Mitchell for inviting me to be here with you today. He is a wonderful friend, mentor, and colleague, and you all are truly blessed to have him. And I would also like to thank the fabulous Dr. Dixon, my sister in the Frederick Douglass Collaborative for all of the outstanding work that you are doing with the Institute. And I am very grateful to be celebrating it with you. And I couldn't come to Edinburgh without giving a shout out to Dr. Margaret Smith, the crown jewel of the Frederick Douglass Collaborative for all of her love and support over the years. As you can see, you have a treasure trove of folks at Edinburgh. And I am so glad to know all of them. Thank you all again so much. It's my privilege today to share with you why Black History Month was, is, and continues to be important. And it's because it's a time to honor our past while extending the path laid down by our ancestors forward, creating new possibilities beyond our wildest dreams. I'm excited to share my thoughts with you all which have been influenced by my life experiences as a Black woman, my profession as a teacher scholar of organizational communication, in which I study organizations and try to prepare my students for their careers after college. All students that are here on the Zoom call today, I want you all to get those careers. So if you need my help, I am here for you. You want somebody to review your resume? I got you. And also my presentation is based on my belief that change will continue to occur within our nation's history, within our story, so long as we keep pressing on. But you know, so often we're fascinated with the now that we skip over an important part of black heritage, which is paying honor to those who went before us, our ancestors. I consider it an honor that I am able to be with you during a time in which here at Edinburgh, you all honor the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I don't know if I truly have the words to express just how grateful I am to Dr. King because I know that without his determination to fight for black people to have the same civil, social, political and economic rights as everyone else, I would not be here with you today. Not because I wouldn't wanna be here with you but because I could not be. Let that sink in. It will be prohibited. And let us not forget that his fight opened up so many doors, 
not just for black people, but for all people of difference. We're talking about women, members of the LGBTQ communities, people of varying ability levels and more. His fight was intersectional. In other words, if it wasn't justice for everybody, it wasn't justice for anybody. And ours must be too. So as we honor the legacy of Dr. King, may we speak the names of our historical foremothers, including Mary McLeod Bethune, Wilma Rudolph, and Marsha P. Johnson, and tell others of their great legacies. May we never forget the hard work of Dr. King, James Baldwin, Representative John Lewis, and all those that went before us, including the man to whom we owe the honor of being able to celebrate this month. Indeed, there would be no Black History Month if it was not for Dr. Carter G. Woodson, co-founder of what we know today as the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, or ASALA. And Dr. Woodson and ASALA created National Negro History Week back in 1926. It was to be celebrated the second week of February because this week contains the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln. By the 1960s, thanks to the advent of the civil rights movement, it grew into a month. And it would not be until the late 1970s that a sitting US president, President Carter, would recognize this month. And now Black History Month is celebrated worldwide by many nations, Canada, Britain, and others. But as we think about this timeline, if we go back to the fact that um, you know, we, we moved from the 20s to the 60s to the 70s, these dates help us to put things into perspective. A lot of times when we think about history, we think of it as being so far away and long ago that it's hard to make tangible connections to it. But these dates remind us that the timeline of the struggle for civil rights is fresh and recent. And while we gladly laud our stalwarts, the giants of our heritage during this time, we are also reminded that Black history is local, it's personal, and it's closer than we may think. For example, my great grandparents participated in the March on Washington, seeing Dr. King's iconic I Have a Dream speech live and in person, being right there with him in the fight for social justice. My grandmother attended segregated schools, being bused past multiple white schools to her school, which was almost 30 minutes away. My parents went to integrated schools and were amongst some of the first integrated classes, and they experienced all the tensions that came with this. And you know, I love sitting at the feet of my great grandparents, my great grandmother, my parents, to hear about all of their experiences and what they went through. You know, this firsthand knowledge is temporal and it must be captured. So today I urge you, talk to the elders in your life and learn from them. They have so much to offer you. Indeed, in their stories, there is so much insight and wisdom, particularly for what we are going through today in the struggle for racial equity. They weathered the storm through prayer, tenacity, perseverance, and determination. This is the stock that we come from. We are overcomers. Their blood flows through our veins. There is nothing that we cannot do. And when we listen to them and we learn from them and we take their experiences and work towards change, we honor them. And we show them that what they went through is not in vain. They have passed us the torch. And it's time, my friends, to keep extending our ancestors' path forward. In this Black History Month, let us usher in a change of paradigm shift as we write our chapter of Black History. Critical race theory reminds us that we live in a society that is rife with institutional and structural racism, but that we don't have to accept this. There can be a better way. There can be the creation of a new normal where future generations will grow up with an appreciation of black heritage and culture ingrained into their everyday experiences in ways that we never did. 
it's time that we center our experiences and demand that they not be pushed to the margins any longer. And the time to do so is now. Why? I'm glad you asked. Because so many businesses, organizations, and people have come out in the wake of the murder of George Floyd with diversity pledges. They offer a message of encouragement for Black people. And they affirm that Black lives do matter. Thank you. We agree. Some offer support and others reaffirm their commitment to supporting Black people. But it's time to see just how committed they are. I want you to go on a journey with me. Let's see this new vision together and how it could work in all aspects of our lives. First, let's start with goods and services. I have a question for you. Have you ever noticed in stores that we Black people have our own sections? They're called things like textured hair care. I saw that one the other day. Or ethnic foods. And I suppose that's if it's there at all. But it's problematic for a few reasons. Firstly, everybody is ethnic. All of us have a heritage. But we know that this term is just a microaggressive euphemism for black and brown folks. And separate sections indicate not standard, outside of the majority, and different. And do you notice where it usually is? It's placement all the way at the end of the row. And this little teeny tiny section also indicates, well, not important. Ouch, that hurts. But what if our items were there in every store as an expectation, not a hope? Because if there is a black need, then all stores should be there to meet it, right? And what if they were not in these small sections, but in the actual places where you would expect to find them? If I'm looking for okra to put in my jambalaya, I go to the vegetable section and there it is. If I'm making my holiday chitlins or pig intestines, then I'm going to the meat department and there they are fresh. Wouldn't that be wild? Like if I didn't have to go to a separate beauty supply store to get what I needed, I just went to the hair section and there were choices for me. If there were hair maintenance aisles that offer things such as oil and moisturizer or hair choice aisles that offer braiding hair, extensions and wigs in a place like Target, what if it was just there? That would be one way to demonstrate to me how much you value me, not just in word, but through actions. It can happen, but how? For those of you that are thinking about careers on this call, you can go and work for these companies to create change from the inside. But if this is not your work calling, then you can call local and corporate management. You can write letters and you can tell people how you feel that you wanna see change. Remind them of what they said in those statements or let's really change the game. How about create your own companies? In the house today, we could have the first black creator and owner of a new big box store, which takes on this perspective. Now, don't worry. I'm only gonna ask you for 10% and some stock ownership because I helped you. The rest will be yours. I'm just kidding. Or am I? Or how about another question? Do you get excited when you hear about somebody at Edinburgh, one of your friends or somebody in the community who's selling plates of traditional foods so that you can get a taste of home? But what if it was different? What if these foods were offered as standard choice offerings when you go to the student center to eat? And that they appeared as a part of standard American cuisine at places such as Applebee's. So many foods from diverse cultures make up the staples of American cuisine that we see on menus and rightly so. Our American history is diverse. But it's also time to see our culture reflected here as well. What do we do to make this happen? Well, you can ask for a meeting with your food service professionals here on campus and talk to them about this. You can go out in town and work with local restaurants to begin updating their menus. You can also reach out to corporate ones to ask them to make changes as well. But let's not just stop here in this realm of our life. Let's go to education. 
what if we talked about Black experiences in all of the classes that we took? Suppression of Black experiences and knowledge upholds the white-Black binary, which privileges white knowledge and experiences as the golden standard of what should be taught and learned. While at the same time, Black experiences are cast aside as less than important. Professors, we can include this in our classes as we plan them. And we can take it a step further. What if we moved beyond the idea of picking the book that has the standard diversity chapter, usually towards the back, but look for ones that weave Black experiences throughout the entire text? And if within our disciplines, these texts don't exist, what if we wrote them? And what if we always had an offering of classes that examined the Black experience in detail because it was something that everyone had to take, not just something that we expect for diverse students to sign up for? Are we examining our general education program and our course offerings? And if so, how do we measure up when we're looking at Black experiences and Black knowledge? We can do the work to change it. Okay, now we're starting to enter into a discussion about the realm of educational policy and procedures, which also prompts me to ask, are we reviewing the policies and procedures that are in place to make sure that the windows of opportunity are opened up for Black students in all that we do, both inside the classroom and outside of it? Do we have policy that requires equity in areas such as study abroad? where we create partnerships to allow our students to study in African and diaspora nations, where Black students can go to learn more about themselves. This shows me that I matter to you as a Black student, and it makes a big impact on my sense of connectedness and belongingness to the university. When I feel seen and when I feel heard, this is where I'm going to stay. This is my family. Now let's move over to the business realm. Can we get to the place where when I finally get the opportunity to visit your beautiful campus, when I walk down Meadville Street, I see flourishing Black businesses. And I don't have to drive down to Homewood where there are higher concentrations of Black individuals to support Black businesses because it's an expectation that everyone will support these businesses just as it is an inherent silent assumption that we will do the same for majority businesses. Let's make it happen. Black innovators, create your business plan. Meet with town officials to see how you can move your business into town. And town officials, let's open up those windows of opportunity. Let's create grants and tax breaks and develop incentives for Black businesses to set up shop in your town and welcome them to make the process more smooth. All right, let's go to another place. You know, it's cool right now. It's the thing to do to amplify Black voices, right? When you get on social media, you see people talking about that. And what does this mean? This is usually when non-Black individuals, usually white people, willingly turn over their platforms to allow Black people to speak through them to their followership. We see this a lot um, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, and this is a good start, but it's not enough. Having a platform is temporary. What about creating long lasting partnerships that bolster black organizations? And what if we did this within corporate, nonprofit and local organizations? Okay, so hear me out. What if a company like Facebook does not buy out a black social media site like a black planet? Some of y'all like, what is that, right? It exists, it's out there, it used to be real popular back in the day, okay? But invest in black social media sites such as black planet. And if Facebook did things such as give them free advertising on Facebook so that people know that they exist and can go and sign up for it. And if Facebook also shared resources with them such as combined corporate training, right? What would that do? for a business such as Black Planet. Or let's go to the nonprofit realm, right? Back in Bloomsburg, I'm the vice president of our United Way in town. So I think, what if the United Way in town at Edinburgh hosted events at Black businesses, right? How could that spark connectivity? How could that bring about unity? Or let's bring it even more local. 
What if student organizations did this across ethnic and racial lines? Could an organization that has a large membership of mostly majority students partner with a multicultural organization? And could these organizations work together on common initiatives? Like for example, if the student government and the Black Student Union Association held a week of Juneteenth programming together and everyone was involved and contributed with their time, their talent and their treasure. These are examples of tangible support that makes a difference in people's lives. Now let's think about careers. What if everyone was given the opportunity to have the experience of working with or knowing a black individual who was in a position of authority in their life. Now to have this happen, we have to cultivate our young people early, introducing our black youth to a range of careers. Because part of it is that if you don't know you can, you won't. If I don't see someone who looks like me in a position, I may subconsciously think it's not for me. If no one tells me that I can, then I may think that I cannot. And this upholds the order of things as they were back in the day. Black people in jobs where they are under leadership, not the leaders themselves. To this, we say no. So what if we started vocation mentorship programs and implemented them within our schools and other sources of black culture, such as churches and temples and mosques? And what if we made sure that every black student that wanted to pursue these paths had what they needed to be able to make it to that point? Now, that's a whole other conversation about reparative justice for another time. So let me get back on track here. The Frederick Douglass Institute is working on one such initiative. I focused my dissertation, the long paper that you write as a requirement to obtain your doctoral degree on why more black individuals decide not to become professors. I found that it's because they believe that the profession gets a bad rap, that it does not pay well, that nobody respects the position, that professors have no social life, and I'm here to tell you that all that is false. I mean, I'm too fabulous to be living that kind of life. If that's what a professor was all about, I just couldn't do it. So a colleague and I, Dr. Veronica Watson, convener of the Frederick Douglass Institute Collaborative, turned this into a program, the Inclusive Future Faculty Program, where underrepresented students interview underrepresented professors to find out the truth about being a professor and to have students consider if this is for them. And our findings are showing that just a simple conversation helps students to visualize themselves in this role and starts to pique their interest about wanting to go to graduate school and wanting to become a professor, right? It works. And if you say to yourself, I'd love to be involved in a program such as this, I'd love to get you connected. So just reach out. I'm gonna share my contact information with you um, before we're all done here today. And while I'm here talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives such as FDI, which is close to my heart because I used to be the director at, at Bloomsburg and currently at Bloomsburg, I'm the special assistant for diversity, equity, and inclusion. What if we sufficiently funded diversity, equity, inclusion offices as they are spaces and places of educational opportunity for all members of the campus community from all backgrounds? This is where much of your training and external programming comes from. So let's fund them at the highest levels because money allows people to do more, to accomplish some of the very goals that I've been talking about today. But it also shows commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Where your treasure is, so your heart lies. And I know that your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion is strong. Let's go over to the world of entertainment. What if we have our networks who celebrate our wonderful and rich history and culture like BET and TV One. We know that we can turn them on 24 seven and see ourselves represented. But what if we also knew that we could pick any time of day and turn on a major network and see our experiences represented there too? Absence of presence indicates that I don't matter to you, that my experiences are not as valuable. But when I see myself, 
I know that you value me. And I also need to see myself positively. Now, much of the scholarship that I do um, in my life as a professor is on stereotypical representation of Blacks in the media. And we've seen some real ugly representations of Mammy figures, of Jezebels, of Black Bucks, right? I think, what if I never had to write another published piece about stereotypical representations because they weren't there? That would be the happiest day of my life. I'd gladly find something else to write on. We can have this. I know we can. How can we? Well, Nielsen ratings are very important to networks, right? Nielsen is the company that tracks every time you open up that TV channel. They're seeing who is watching what. So you can indicate your um, happiness or dissatisfaction with the network by just not turning on that channel. And the amount of ratings that they get will say something to them. It's also a good idea to reach out to them directly and to tell them that you demand different types of programming. Let's also promote our own content. We're seeing a rise of uh, many Black media creators on platforms such as TikTok and Instagram, right? Let's build and let's grow together. So really, overall, what I am asking is, what if our actions matched our talk? If we centered equity for Black individuals, which is about each of us getting what we need to survive or succeed, access to opportunity, networks, resources, and supports based on where we are and where we want to go. And that's a definition that comes to us from Walker and Russell in 2016. What if we centered Black equity in all that we do? How would and could our world be different? And the answer is drastically. Now, I know that some of you all are thinking this could never happen. Well, they thought the same things about our ancestors' aspirations. And look at what has happened. Look at how far we have come because of them. But we know that we still have a long way to go. And this is why we need Black History Month. We need Black History Month because it reminds us of our roots and what we have been through. We need Black History Month because it inspires us to take our fight for our rights to new levels. And we need Black History Month because the future of generations yet to come depends on the actions that we take now. So my friends, I ask you, what will you do? And as you reflect, I want to share that I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. But at the end of the day, I'm still a teacher. I love to talk, but I also love active engagement. So after there's an opportunity for me to answer any questions that you may have, I have some questions for you. And I'm looking forward to us continuing our dialogue. Thank you so much. Dr. Short, I'm going to interrupt for just a minute. Um, doc, everyone, uh, I met Dr. Short about a year ago. I think it was a year ago in January at a, at a, a Frederick Douglass uh, meeting. And um, I just sat at the table and watched her and paid attention to her words. She was at a really big table and um, she was so thoughtful and so um, serious about the work she was doing with Frederick Douglass. I love the Frederick Douglass program. I, I want to take a moment to thank Dr. Dixon, Dr. Margaret for all the work that they do through the system. It has such an impact on, on, on the campus. Ursula Payne is here watching today. Ursula is doing wonderful work at Slippery Rock. So it's a wonderful program. So if you don't know about it, go read about it. But Dr. Shorter, um, you wondered a couple yesterday whether or not you would be enough. <laughs> you must be joking. <laughs> of course, of course, you're more than enough. I'm not going to interrupt the questions. I, you guys I have to go to another meeting, but I wanted everybody to know I'm so grateful to Dr. Dale for coming to introduce. I'm so grateful to Chris and the marketing team for supporting the work for Black Heritage Month. We had a wonderful month. And Dr. Shorter, you were, you were the exact thing we needed to end the month. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let's talk. I'm looking at the chat. 
And so I didn't have a chance to really keep it, keep an eye on the chat while I was uh, doing my thing. So let me see what's been going on here. Um, so many people are, are just kind of, you know, bringing such a rich perspective. So I hope that you all have been taking a look at the chat as well. Um, so let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Mitchell said, I miss Black Planet. If you, if you all missed the Black Planet wave, it's not too late. Um, Black Planet is a social media site that was created in response to um, Facebook. This Facebook was kind of a mainstream site um, where, where everybody could be, which is awesome. Um, but Black Planet was supposed to be just for Black people, right? It was a space and a place where we didn't have to justify ourselves or who we were. And it was uh, it, it did a lot of the same things that Facebook did. You could have um, friends, connections. You could actually design your own web page. And it was actually co-founded by a Black professor. Right. So um, he saw a space and he saw a need and it was really popular back in the early 2000s. And since then, um, its popularity has has dipped down uh, a little bit. But what if we brought it back? Right. What if we what if we all got back on Black Planet and we used it in new ways and we used it to do um, things that we see on more mainstream platforms like we had a, a networking, a business networking section like on LinkedIn. I may have to call uh, the good professor up who founded this today. Yeah, uh, Dr. Pack, another wonderful uh, Frederick Douglass uh, representative says, I support an independent Black social media platform because we have the advertising dollars. There's a drive to support Blackness without representation. Yeah, right. So our money determines a lot of things, right? We don't, a lot of times we just think that we don't have choice, right? That we don't have the opportunity to, you know, to, to influence things, but we do, right? Where you put your money is an investment and people notice it. People notice it, right? Money matters, right? So we're seeing that good ideas and initiatives die without support. Thank you, Dr. Dale, right? So, and, and please know that I'm a partner. I didn't come here to just shake things up and be like, you know, we should do this, 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 and this. Know that if I come here and say something, I'm here to work with you. At Bloomsburg, we're working on these very same things. So in my role as special assistant, we have a president's commission for diversity, equity, inclusion that I co-chair. And so we're working on these things together, right? Awesome. In the chat, I'm also seeing too, Dr. Peck says Nielsen is always represented at the Congressional Black Caucus. They engage with participants for feedback. Yes. Yeah, so if you feel strongly about seeing representation on the media, or if you want to see different types of programming, being able to be in these spaces is really important. Sign up for the emails that come out from the Congressional Black Caucus. Here's a way for you to be able to uplift your voice and be involved in the conversation. Ms. Barbara Thompson rightly reminds us that the Pennsylvania Black Conference on Higher Education, we're having our annual conference. If you want to continue to talk through these issues together, um, to think about ways that we can change uh, our, our, our culture, please go to our website. We would love for you to sign up and register. We're also still accepting proposals uh, for our conference, so we'd love to have you share your knowledge too. Dr. Pack says, our ancestors were successful in spite of having 50 plus years of access to the vote after the Jim Crow period. Our ancestors were successful in spite of being freed without land, money, and social political equality. Yes, right? So if our ancestors could do it, what's stopping us? A lot of times we're too willing to take the status quo as it is. We don't see beyond the layers. We don't think about pushing it to that next level. And so today I'm pushing us all. I'm challenging us, right? We don't have to accept things as they are, right? We come from a rich history and a rich tradition of people who pushed back and refused to accept the status quo. And so can we. Dr. Pack also says, can you speak to the fact that black women lead the change and are often in conflict with black male patriarchy as well as socio-political systems? Absolutely. Black women, we owe you the world. I mean, if you've been watching the news lately, you know that black women saved the day in so many aspects of our society. When it came to voter turnout, who were the people who were out there knocking on doors? When it came to getting people to the polls, who were the people picking people up? When it came to the people devising the strategies, who were the ones who were making those calls? It's black women. Yeah, black women are constantly some of the most disrespected individuals within our society. And we see this happening for a very long time. You ever looked at the picture of uh, Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, right? Very moving moment. Like I said, my great grandparents were there. But if you notice in the background, especially when they do that close up, it's all men. There weren't any women that were up on the stage with him, right? And that's a problem. 
And that speaks to a long legacy in history of erasing Black women from our, our traditions of in inclusiveness and unity and advancing our cause together. So it's time to redeem that. Right? Dr. Peck says they leave out Dr. Dorothy Height, right? I'm a member of the National Council of Negro Women. She was our longest um, running president who did so much for Black women. And so now I'm really grateful that Black women are starting to get their due, but it's not enough. We need more representation, right? I'd love to see more Black women in positions of leadership across all aspects of our society. I'd love to see more Black women being presidents of universities in PASHI right? or across education. I'd love to see more Black women as leaders of networks. Right? We have to demand that. And again, a lot of it comes from what we introduce our young people to. So if you know people who are in these positions, are you asking them to come in to be guest speakers? Whether you're in a collegiate setting or a K through 12 setting, a lot of times in the collegiate setting, we forget that we can do these kind of things, right? We can have guest speakers, we can take field trips, we can do all these things. So make sure that you're bringing in Black women to your spaces so that our students can be inspired, all right? Thank you. Angela Burroughs asks, what most fuels your passion for your work? That's a really good question. I think really that uh, having this, this um, legacy of wanting to change things and make things better than you initially found, it comes from my great-grandmother. She was very involved in service work within our church. I think she had every position in, in, in the church. She was a communion store, a trustee, a usher. She directed the choir. She, she did it all, right? She was an Eastern star, which is very ingrained in Black history, right? So being a part of um, or community organizations and being a part of um, organizations uh, such as fraternal or sororal organizations, where at that point in time, Black people didn't have a whole lot of choices about organizations that could be a part of, but they came together to make changes within their community, right? When someone had a need, they met it. If somebody's house burned down, they raised the money, they put together their small means to be able to make sure that that person could make do. And so this passion for wanting to make change really comes from her and that fuels me today. Now, what continues to fuel me? My students. I tell them every day. When I'm in the classroom with them and I'm sharing some of this information with them and I hear how they apply it and the ideas that they come up with, that's how I know I picked the right career. And that's how I know that we're in good hands. I know it can be depressing to get up every day and to look at the news and to see what negative thing is going on. But when I hear them and when I see them, I know that everything is gonna be all right. By the way, we have a faculty member who has a son that goes to Edinburgh. Y'all have the best and the brightest, right? So they are also what encourages me to keep going on every single day, every single day. Chris asked if he can ask a question on video. Of course, let's continue the conversation. Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a quick question. And I think as we wrap up Black History Month and we enter uh, Women's History Month, I know from Edinburgh's standpoint, we have a very engaging community. Uh, we just ran the stats and we've reached over 9,000 people with these conversations, with these videos. So as far as the university is concerned, um, we're very engaged in it. But on the other hand, there are circles of the population that see Black History Month or a Black History or a, um, uh, an African American social media channel and ask why not the opposite. So why not, you know, a White History Month or why not a Men's History Month? Um, and we we do see that, especially a lot in like social media conversations, and a lot of it is you know self-admitted trolls or people that just want to pick arguments. But clearly we're showing that it is important because people are engaged in it and you clearly have a lot of passion for it. So what are some things that you say about, you know, why, like it, what, what are some good talking points if we were to ever encounter somebody that asked that kind of question? Absolutely. So first of all, let me just give you all some snaps for all of the work that you've been doing with Black History Month. I'm um, seeing the impressive lineup of programming that you all have had has just been so fantastic. And I'm so glad that so many people have been uh, participating in all the great activities that, that you are doing. And this is a, 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 a common question that comes up quite a bit that there are so many people who are like, why are we doing things exclusively? Um, or if we do things exclusively, then everybody should have their own lane. But here's what I say, right? 
So growing up, when I was in a history class, uh, when I went to, you know, the, the class is called history, what history was I learning? I was learning about the experiences of the majority. If I heard something about me, it was like a, a, a paragraph, right, or two, right? And as Dr. Dale so rightly told us, where does it usually begin with slavery? Then where does it go to the civil rights movement? Then now where does it end? With Barack Obama, right? And we've come full circle and, and every, everything is all good, right? No, it's left out so much. So when people ask why we need these separate spaces and places, because growing up, if I really wanted to learn about my Black history, I learned about it at home because my grandmother made me read books on the Black experience because she knew that I wasn't getting it in school. If I wanted to learn about Black history, I had to get it in church where we had pageants during Black History Month and we had to give speeches by people like Frederick Douglass that we would know our own culture and our own heritage. If it's not something that we've internalized within our American history as something that is important to teach, we gotta have a space to get that information out there. Now, of course, my vision will be that we do internalize it, right? So that these uh, additional spaces are just supplementary, but we ain't there yet, we're far from it. And so until we get there, we need these spaces and places, right? And I believe that everybody's history should be celebrated. Make no mistake, right? When I say diversity, I mean it writ large. So I think that everybody should have the opportunity to do this, but I think that we also need to recognize that there have been those people whose voices have been amplified, right? As we talked about today for a really long time. And so we need to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to have their culture reflected as well. Yeah, thank you. Hi. All right, do we have any more questions from our participants on the Zoom call or anybody else from, from Facebook? I did wanna thank uh, Dr. Shorter for that. That was, a, that was a great response. And I think sometimes whether you are um, an underrepresented group or if you're in the uh, majority group, there are some, um, there, people are seeking for ways to be allies, but also, you know, to respect that, yes, we do need to focus on Black History Month. And I, I think in our culture, it's, we, we have a lot of people that are self-centered and self-righteous and they want to be part of something when they, uh, where we need to just admit that, you know, we need, a, we need more than a month to celebrate the, the achievements of African-American history. But, you know, we're, we're asking for 28, 29 days to celebrate Black History Month. And I think we did a, a, a fantastic job with Dr. Mitchell and, and the programming. So um, I, th I think, uh, does anybody else have anything they wanted to, to mention or to say or? Um, you know, I just want to, Chris, just again, thank um, Dr. Shorter for participating and contributing and for everyone else who joined in. I mean, you made such a wonderful point about it being integrated. And, you know, our last week's session, we talked about how do you integrate it in curriculum and that it's a part of it. We just went through an administration, why this is so important, where there was an executive order about um, debunking, right, diversity trainings and, you know, had that gained momentum, what would that look like in terms of federal funding and instruction? We saw even rhetoric playing out in schools. And so not just around Black history, but as you so eloquently um, spoken and, and articulated that this is really about who we are um, as community with, you know, across our country, black, brown, blue, purple, however you want to <laughs> describe yourself, but that all of us, um, you know, our success, all of our success, all of our knowledge is a collective game um, as a community. And how do we learn from that? And you're right. I learned, I was carefully taught, not the poem that was in a negative way, carefully taught as a young girl with my great grandmother about who I was and how I was to experience the world. And, you know, it, that comment came up from one of our alum in that presentation. And my point was, you know what? We still have to teach in that same way. We really have not accomplished that where we have fully arrived that we're teaching our full history. Yes. Um, whether we're talking about African-American history, Latino history, Asian history, we're not teaching our full history that we can all embrace it. And it's because we're still grappling with issues around trust and our sense of connection to one another in this, in, in, across our community. So thank you again for sharing that. Hopefully we get to a point in our, um, in our lifetime, at least I hope I see it where that this is so interwoven and so mm. integrated that we won't talk about months of celebration. That's right. We will just That's simply right. celebrate who we are um, across our community. So thank you again. 
Thank you, Dr. Shorter. I really enjoyed your presentation today. I, I did put in the chat a comment about Dr. Pack and many others who revitalized. We've had a, um, a, a Black Histories minor at Clarion and they revitalized it and brought it alive again and, and innovated it. The students were so interested in learning. When you talked about that being left out of the history books, that's a big disservice to the entire society. Nobody got to hear the rich stories and that's just wrong and we need to fix that. You're absolutely you. right, Dr. Dale. And, and that's, a, that's a path that we're walking you know, every single day. And I'm actually glad that you made that point because um, remember I told you all that I had questions for you, right? Oh, I hope you didn't think that I was gonna do my little thing and then be like, all right, everybody, bye, have a good day, right? So I have a question for you. What are you going to do to help to usher in this paradigm shift, right? And it doesn't have to be something that I said today, but what can you do to make sure that we prioritize Black History 365? You know, McDonald's, let me give a shout out to McDonald's. Some of y'all may remember that McDonald's started this campaign a real long time ago, right? That Black History is 365, and that's how we should think about it. It's not just a February thing, right? But what are some specific action steps that you are going to take to move us into this new direction where Black is not just a category? Right? And black is not just something that we do um, when, when a certain time rolls around, but it's a part of us. So I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can write things in the chat. You can get on the mic and, and share with me, but let's exchange some ideas about how we can make this happen. I'd love to hear from you. I, I think, um, personally, I have um, a teenager and a two-year-old at home. And I think the best way for us is to share it with the kids, to start with the, the, the young generation too. So. Um, what, when I was in fourth grade, I did um, an eye-opening report on um, Harriet Tubman. So we, I've been sharing, um, you know, YouTube videos and, and history clips about them with my teenager and, you know, and talking about, you know, making it come to life that, that I'm not just lecturing about the topic, but that it should become part of our normal history that we're talking about. It, it, because, you know, I was lucky to grow up in a school where we did learn about some black history when we were in school, but like you said, Dr. Shorter, it's a small paragraph or it's a small chapter. And usually when we talk about it, we don't talk about it in a good light. So um, reading, you know, reading about Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, I think uh, bought the, the book, uh, Hidden Figures for Kids. Like there, there's so many, there's so much out there. And I think even um, uh, Ellie Weissel's Night, like there are so many things that you can talk about and, and um, from different cultures and different you know, just to make the kids upbringing more well-rounded. And I think working on the younger generation, I think it really, really has helped out. And it also helps out, us out as parents um, and educators and people that want to, you know, highlight the accomplishments of, of, of people from different backgrounds. Absolutely. Christopher is speaking to what type of information are you introducing your children to in the home, right? Which also causes us to think about the, um, the idea of the canon, right? So there are certain things that we think that our kids should read. Dr. Seuss. But have y'all gone and done some research on Dr. Seuss and his background and some of his beliefs? I'll let you figure that out on your own if you haven't. Okay. Well, one of the things that um, I'd like to say is that we need to do it systemically. Schools should not be allowed not to teach about all histories. It's just like we think about Thanksgiving in a good light, but as a Native American, it's really very devastating to go back and think about how Thanksgiving has impacted them. So I think that we should have the schools where kids are required to go be forced to teach about all people, not just segments of people. You're absolutely right, Dr. Smith. I know that voice anywhere, and I am sending you my love. Thank you so much for bringing up that important point. We need to start having these conversations. When is the last time that we went down to the school board and asked these questions, right? When is the last time that we asked to see the curriculum? When is the last time that we asked these questions of ourselves? So some of us here are faculty members. In our department meetings, are we asking our colleagues, hey, can I ask you what book or what readings you're using? Because I want to make sure that you're including various perspectives, right? If not, it can start there. Very simple questions that shape an entire generation, right? Your students go on to remember the things that you share with them for years down the road. Can you imagine how just small changes like that are gonna make a big impact, right? That's awesome. In the chat, 
Jen Redinger says, I homeschool my two children and I make sure to teach them about black history. And we try to learn about some of the important figures that are left out of the mainstream education system. Absolutely, absolutely, right? Um, and also too, I think it's a great point to, to point out that um, you know there are key figures that as um, in, in American society we like to uphold, right? So we love to uphold Dr. King for everything that we that he did. By the way, y'all do know that when Dr. King was assassinated, America did not like him, right? He, we, we reclaimed him and repurposed him as this American hero. Black people, we always loved him. Um, but it's just funny how the, 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 the psyche works in, in that perspective. But then we also don't you know, do the work to learn about people, maybe some that, that I mentioned. Some of y'all may not be familiar with Mary McLeod Bethune. You may not be familiar with um, Marsha P. Johns. You may not be familiar with these individuals. So I think that when we talk about Black history too, and we talk about what we're teaching students, we also need to make sure that we're including many people within that discussion from some of the largest names that are well known to again, the everyday people, everyday history matters, right? Awesome. Dr. Shorter. Yes. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a student here at Edinburgh. So I kind of have a perspective. Um, coming from uh, a small city in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, right next to Detroit, we come, we're majority minorities. And so coming here, it was kind of like a culture check for me, but coming into here, um, the one thing I focused on is offering perspectives and continue like challenging. So like for, I don't know like how many students, I know a lot of my teammates are on here, but something that we've been trying to do, like I've been trying to do is just kind of challenge everything my professors have been teaching, uh, especially a lot of history classes um, and just offering my perspective. Cause I know a lot of people here don't know uh, I'm Arab, but uh, so I just bring my perspective and how the minorities are and just, challenge pretty much everything we're learning. Well, I love that. First of all, thank you so much for, for sharing your perspective and know um, that we are in solidarity in this struggle together. The most powerful question that you have is why? I love that question. I think that a lot of people think that when you're in a class, you're just supposed to listen to what your professor says, but dig deeper. where did you get that information from? Or why did you select this information and not other information? And are we open to sharing more diverse perspectives? If you're comfortable too, sharing your own experience, right? So um, I'll never forget one of the most powerful conversations I ever had with my student was about the holidays. And um, I said, you know, I think that one of the, the, the moments when I realized that I was black and I was different from um, people that I grew up with is when we we're talking about the foods that we ate, right, around holidays. I just thought that for Thanksgiving, everybody had fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, collard greens, um, homemade stuff and all that kind of stuff. But I realized that wasn't the case. And so sharing that allowed me to push back on this traditional narrative that everything should be one way, right? And then it also opened up a really good conversation for people to be able to share um, aspects of their own culture as well. So I had a chance to learn about the Feast of the Seven Fishes and more. So always being willing, if you're comfortable, to be able to share your experiences, to open up people to totally new perspectives, totally new ways of seeing the world. They're going to thank you for it. Trust me. I know that we're almost at time, almost at time, but I'm, I'm always in that professor mode. Anybody else have one more thing they wanna share? I'm gonna go with the children because I've been sending books to my sorority sister's children that are Afrocentric. So they just receive books in the mail and then I get a call. Did you send this package? So that's what I've been doing, just sending books to the children. And, and for my granddaughters as well, just, Afrocentric books and native centered books as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are book lovers up in here. We love a good book. Again, what you introduce people to shapes their perspective. It's important. So think about the gifts that you give to people, right? And what are you sending them? Um, are you buying gifts from black owned businesses, right? That's a way uh, to be able to show people, hey, I'm giving you this creation from people who are like you, right? You don't have, just have to go and buy things uh, that are standard, that are majority. And I'm gonna close with this comment. Miss Barbara Thompson says in the chat, I grew up in segregated schools in Birmingham, Alabama, where most of the history I learned in and out of school was black history. I now participate in literacy programs, sharing books by and about blacks to children we should share our experiences wherever we are. That's right. Whatever your background is, whatever your platform is, share it. Find ways to share it through nonprofit organizations, through um, moments like this, spaces where you have conversations, through working with student organizations. Make sure that you are getting that information out there because it is so important. 
And speaking of um, getting information out there, I want to get this information out there to you all. Here's a way to stay in touch with me. I would love to continue the conversation with you. I would love to work with you. Again, consider me a partner in the struggle that we are all experiencing together as we press on for more social, political, civil rights for Black people and for all people as well. Thank you all so much. It has I, been a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, and I look forward to connecting with you. I just wanted to add one more thing before we close up. Um, if, if anybody knows Dr. Rhonda Matthews here at Edinburgh, she's on a lot of our um, uh, panels and everything. Uh, about three years ago now, we held a special viewing at the local movie theater where we showed Black Panther. And we took a bunch of students to there. We had a, a private showing. And Dr. Matthews gave a great presentation about um, the, the cultural depictions and the characters and everything. And uh, she, she's funny, she's hilarious if anybody's had her. She, before, the, before the film, she said, um, and if anybody hasn't seen Black Panther, it's definitely a, a must, a must view. She said, I will have you understand this. The film represents a cultural moment. Middle-aged geeks like me have been waiting to see someone who looks like us in this capacity for years. This moment is 55 years in the making. So we are not just talking about a movie, we are talking about a socio-political movement. I do not want you to miss that in all the glory of the movie we, the, that the movie will have. And that always stood out to me because like we talked about with books and, and, and films too. So we, this is definitely part of our culture here at Edinburgh and we appreciate um, Dr. Short and everybody for joining us today for, the, for that conversation. All right, so thank you so much for everybody for joining us today. Um, Dr. Shorter did um, include her email, but for those of you watching on, on Facebook, her email is sshorter, S-S-H-O-R-T-E-R, -S -S -E at bloomu.edu. Um, and you can also add any comments in the chat if you have follow-up questions, and we'll make sure that Dr. Shorter gets them. So thank you very much, um, and everybody enjoy the rest of your, if you're in Edinburgh, the rest of your sunny day. Thank you. Stay, stay healthy, everybody. Bye-bye.